few announcements. <clears throat> First of all, I'm, I'm normally in the lab for office hours on Wednesday afternoon. Today, I won't be there until 2.30, so I'll be there after 2.30 until 4.30. I have to go do a 10.50 introduction to engineering, which is always entertaining at 1.30. <clears throat> Lab one went pretty well last night. Anybody want to dispute it? Who was there? I think it, there there was. Yeah. Oh, oh, you were there. Okay. Um, we saw some strange stuff, which I'll go through a little bit today. I cleaned up a little bit of documentation in Lab one on the basis of feedback I got from students. In particular, there was a typo, I think maybe, wait a minute, I'll do one other thing. One, one student uh, said uh, that it was really a pain and not very, and pretty annoying to put that, to find that macro that suppressed warnings for PLIB, and she had a much better way to do it, and that was to go to the Run menu, this is quite a long path, project configuration, tab, customize, customize, XC32 compiler, and then click the box that says use legacy. Live C. And that apparently turns off the warnings without having to put lots of macros everywhere. <clears throat> now I want to go to lab one. Hmm, that's pretty blank. Okay, it says I'm on the laptop. It, the, the green light is on up there. Why are we not seeing anything? Well, this will be tedious if I can't display it because then I have to do a lot of hand waving. I, of course, tested this two minutes ago. So. Turn off. Turn the the. I suppose I could cycle the power on this thing, if I can figure out how to do it. System will shut down. When in doubt, reboot. Oh, now it's cooling. Okay, so it's got to cool before it can restart. In any case, let me just talk for a minute then. There was a reference to timer 1, which should have been a reference to timer 2. That was corrected. And 
it turns out that the new distribution of the 1.4 distribution of XE32 compiler no longer has PLIB examples in it. The version 3.1 that was still on my desktop computer had PLIB examples, how to do all the peripherals. So I zipped them up and put them in lab one. So the zip file is in lab one. There's probably 20 or 30 different peripheral examples. For instance, how to configure the comparator. It's still cooling. Wow. It's got a large thermal mass. Or it just doesn't like me today. So I also linked up some information on, I, I linked up a two-line stanza for turning on the comparator because a couple of groups couldn't make it work last night. I still don't know what the problem was last night because the most obvious thing worked for me. And uh, if I could turn on the monitor, I would show you. Okay, now it's warming up again. Let's see if it's happier now. The beam came on. The display is blank. So I can see light coming out of the aperture, but it's not that bright. Okay, I guess we're going to do without this. Another thing that happened last night, two things with regard to the TFT displays. One group put the connector on upside down. And as a result, we had to learn how to cut it off of the board. So I now know how to, how to do that. But I also put a picture up of what it should look like. An end view so that you can see the connector. And hopefully that'll help with that problem. And another group broke one of the displays in half. <laughs> and I'm not sure how that happened either. They are glass, folks. It's a glass plate with some stuff on the bottom. So if you grab it in the middle, put your thumb in the middle, and lift up on the top trying to get it out of the board, you'll snap it in half. If you have to take it out of the board, and I don't, I don't suggest that, then what you want to do is to pry it gently loose from the, from the whiteboard with a screwdriver so that you're putting minimum torque on the whole, the whole structure. Another good idea is, well, I guess as long as I don't have a display here, I may as well use the whiteboard, or the blackboard. If this is your whiteboard, you could hook the liquid crystal display on like this and dangle it as far out as you possibly can, which by the way is what the TAs did. Or 
you could arrange it so that there's only one row of exposed pins to hook to and overlap it on the board so it is maximally supported. That cuts down the twisting torque when you jam it into your storage box and generally protects the display from being bent. You should probably do that. If you break the display, I have a link up now. I just I sent you an email de describing how you can buy a new one. <clears throat> PPS info. Okay, so. Uh, sorry. Okay, so what is going on here? I guess maybe it's time to try and debug the interface. It did what? It did something? Well, it showed, oh, so maybe we have a bad connector here. What did it do? It did, it, it flashed. Okay, time for some percussive maintenance. Percussive maintenance works remarkably well in a number of circumstances because most failures are open circuits. And if you happen to get lucky, you can bang them back together. But I'm not going to get lucky today, I guess. Yeah, you want to, <clears throat> I suppose you could, uh, somebody got a VGA output that's uh, active, haul it up here. I had also, I don't know what this Apple connector is called, it's the, it's the little one with flat, yeah, but let's see if, Wow. Okay, you got something on that screen? So it's not embarrassing. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> Damn. Okay, so you're good. Well, let's leave it here for a minute. So this implies that my uh, iPad has a small problem, or the adapter does. Okay, I'll have to figure that out. Okay, can I use it? Yeah. All right, thanks. I won't. <laughs> oh, dear, dear. Uh, that's going to make the 1050 tedious today, too. Lab one happens to already be open. Isn't that handy? Oh, that's not a touch screen, is it? <laughs> How quickly we get used to these things. So, The main changes I made to lab one, wow, that's, that's pretty small font on there. And I, control plus on this machine. Ooh, okay, better. <clears throat> The main changes I made to the lab were to, after the link to the peripheral library uh, document, I put up a, a page of PLIB examples in a zipped uh, version of it. I put up a, these are pages from the, uh, the PIC32 
hardware manual, uh, part manual, which uh, gives the, P, uh, the PDIP pinout, the signal names, the peripheral pin select input table, and the PPS output table, which I found I was referring to all the time and didn't feel like flipping back and forth through the uh, data sheet for. <clears throat> In the, in the measurements section, I added a little stanza here on how to open the compare one, which is CMP1 open. You enable it, you enable its output, and you set the negative input to IV ref. The output pin is on the peripheral pin select. So we have to link C1 out to a port. I chose RPB9, which is pin 18. And it's in peripheral pin select group 4. So those two lines turn on the comparator so that if I put a, a triangle wave in here, I got a square wave out of pin 18. If I put a triangle wave into pin 7, I got a square wave out of pin 18. So that is sufficient. If we go, let's see, did I do anything else to this? Oh, I, I did a couple of edits in, in here to change task to thread and cleaned up the, 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 the words here a little bit. But if we go back up to this, to the PLIB examples, <clears throat> Microchip had a nice HTML page that I stole along with all of the uh, code. Uh, go to the analog comparator. Source. CMP basic. And there's a short code here which, again, turn, tells you how to turn on the compare. In this case, they're enabling it. They're selecting non-inverting output, which is the default. They're, out, they're doing an output disable, which means it does not go to the output pin. They're putting it in run in idle mode. <clears throat> so even if the CPU is idling, the comparator still runs. The comparator is generating no event. This is where you turn on an interrupt if you wanted to. And we're using the positive input from the C1 in pause, which is pin 7. And then we can read the status of the comparator with CMP1 read. CMP1 read works with the internal signal, even if you don't output the signal to a port pin. In your case, you're going to want to output it to a port pin because you need to loop the comparator output back into a input capture module. You want the comparator to trigger a time capture on a cycle accurate basis. To do that, the only way that I've been able to figure out how to do it is to route it off the chip and back on again. So you're going to want to have the output enabled here. But, uh, the compulsion to use touch screen is really <coughs> Strong. So, any questions about this this point? So, if we go down here to the the, the peripheral pins or oh, the the signal names, I had trouble following them. So, I thoughtfully highlighted in minty green the the package that we're using in the lab which hopefully will make it slightly easier to, to relate signal names to pin numbers. 
This table also gives you some signals which are defined by the architecture, but only exist on 40 pin packages, not on the 28 pin packages. So, wow, where, oh. So, any questions at this point? What questions do you have about lab one? Next thing to do is to show you an, uh, a, a compare capture, input compare, I should say, Output, output compare module generate pulse sequence inputted back into the input capture to get its period. But there are a lot of questions on Monday. No questions today? <coughs> yes? Disable, I don't disable interrupts. I disable this interrupt. So let's say that you interrupted on a compare. Takes about 50 cycles to get into the interrupt service routine. Takes 20 or 30 cycles then to, well, probably five, five to 10 cycles to read the timer two timer, and given that the time to get into the interrupt probably depends slightly on the context the CPU is in, you, it's going to be very di difficult to get cycle accurate measurements that way. Whereas if you run it back into the input capture, then as soon as the edge comes through on the input capture pin, the Timer 2 is copied to a register in hardware with no software interaction. And it is therefore it can be cycle accurate. Trick here is whenever possible, eliminate slow, annoying software and do it in hardware. <laughs> If the interrupt latency were a constant and you were doing subtractions of to get a period, then, then the method would work. It would be an interesting experiment to do to see how accurate that is. I don't have a feeling for this architecture. On the, on the AVR, the dispersion for getting into an interrupt was uh, three cycles. And uh, on this architecture, I don't know. What other questions? That is something to worry about. The latency between, so when you start charging again, So when you start charging, you have to separately turn an output to an input and start a timer. Question is, how close together in time can you do that? That's what you're asking. And Again, I haven't looked at the output of the compiler, but you can do that. If you, there's a, there's a uh, menu item, I think, called View or Windows towards the right-hand end of the, uh, of the list. And one of the entries there is uh, 
uh, view output or something obscure and you ask to view the assembly and it'll flip open a window with the assembly language in it for the code you've just written and if you're clever and put a searchable keyword in a, in a, in a comment you can search down to the, the assembly language that corresponds to the, to, the, to the C code you've just written and you can find out. My guess is that if you put a if you turn on the port, <clears throat> if you make the port an input, and then in the next C statement start the timer, that first of all, the, the delay is going to be constant, and it's probably going to be on the order of two or three cycles. You could measure that and subtract it. Or, Another possibility is do a linear least squares fit to the capacitances you measure and figure out what the offset is. But I think it's going to be small, at least compared to a microsecond. Probably less than 1%. To me, do you know what the latency between those two is by any chance? I've never looked at that. There's all kinds of code I haven't looked at yet. <clears throat> we can do that in lab if you want. We can go through it and, and, and look at some of the assembly language. It's entertaining. See what the compiler does. What else? Everything's good. Time to go on lab two? No, let's do, let's do some uh, input compare code. <clears throat> so on the ProtoThreads page, after I got done describing proto-threads, I threw in a little section on timer output, PWM, and input capture, partly because it was the first stuff I wrote using proto-threads. But there's an example here that does kind of a <clears throat> an artificial thing. The microcontroller is set up so that Pin 4 produces a, a square wave every time timer 2 expires. Every time timer 2 times out, you get a square pulse out of the thing. Pin 14 is hooked to output compare unit 2, which is producing a square wave a square wave that turns on halfway through the timer 2 cycle and turns off on the end of the timer 2 cycle. And pin 18 is hooked to OC3, which is producing a square wave which goes high at the one quarter point and low again at the halfway point of the cycle of the timer 2 cycle. I did this to see if I could, if I understood how the output compare units worked, and also to play around with the idea of, of, of pulse position modulation. Then the thing which was artificial was to run this back into input capture 1 on pin 6. So one of these one of these waveforms is, was then run back into the CPU. And what I better recover, the input capture system here, if I subtract two sequential input captures, I better recover exactly to the nearest cycle the period of timer two. So I'm going to capture, let's say, every rising edge of this waveform it better have exactly the same period as timer two. 
If I get the same number out here that I programmed into timer two, then I believe I understand how it operates. Otherwise, I don't know anything, which is usually the case. So this is artificial in the sense that one timer is, is generating a waveform, and another timer, input capture one, is actually hooked to timer three here. Another timer with its input ca associated input capture is measuring the time I just already know. And most of this code Most of this code, the interesting, it's not touchscreen. So there's a little summary up in the upper, uh, at the upper part of the, of the screen there. Pin four is, is toggled by timer two interrupt. Pin 14, 18 are output compares. Pin six is input capture. We set up the timers, but let's go down now and look at, at, at main where all of the interesting stuff is here because once you get it all set up, reading it is fairly easy. We're going to do a lot of setup. First of all, we're going to configure, let's see if we can blow this up a little bit. Control plus, huh? Much nicer. So, First thing we're going to do is set up timer two to generate the wave period. And this is going to be on some sort of generate period time base here that is interactively set by the by uh, serial input. We're open timer two by turning it on. We set the source to internal, which means use the peripheral bus. We set the prescaler to one. And so we know within a cycle, what the timer period is, how often this is ticking. <clears throat> we configure the interrupt for timer two to be on and give it priority two. And then we clear the flag just because it's an obsessive thing to do. Now, it turns out that in this architecture, you can have several output compare units all hooked to the same timer. So you can phase lock pulse streams. In this case, output compare three and output compare two are both running off of timer two as a source. So we're turning them on. We're specifying the source for both of these is timer two. I think the option is timer two or timer three. I think that's the only two you can use. We're going to put it into continuous pulse mode. There's a list of five different modes. Continuous pulse is the one that produces continuous pulses. And then there are two parameters. This is the value of the timer at which the waveform goes high. This is the time at which it goes low again. So in this case, we're having the, the timer go high at half the period, period shifted right by one, and it drops low again at the end of the period. This output compare is going high at one quarter of the period and going low again at half the period. We have to hook them up to output pins. So OC3 is put on RPB9, which is still pin 18. I can't believe I'm actually memorizing these. Uh, and RPB5, I haven't got yet. It's probably around 14. 13 or 14. Oh, it is 14. Oh, there. <laughs> Good documentation. Okay, so we said it's in group 2, output OC2, RPB5. So this then configures the two output compares off the same timer and connects them to output bits. 
So they're sitting there chugging away. Any questions on this? So next then, so the hardware is set up to produce the, to produce the, the waveforms. <clears throat> now we're going to turn on timer three, turn it on, set the source to internal, prescaler to one, and set the timeout to FFFF. It's a 16-bit it's a timer, so FFFF is the maximum count. And therefore, it is free running. It runs to full scale, sets back to zero, runs to full scale, sets back to zero. The advantage of running it full scale like this is that let's say that an, out, an input capture occurs with across a overflow boundary. So you have a capture. <clears throat> During the next period of the of the square wave, you have an overflow, and then you have another capture. Okay? Got it? So what happens when you do the subtraction? I want to subtract the new value from the old value. It works. It gives you the correct period because large numbers where the high bit is set are negative. <clears throat> So by having this just continuously overflow, we don't have to worry about correcting for, for durations that were, that were measured across a, an overflow of the timer. I did, I, I had, it took a while to prove that to myself. So then we're going to, now we're going to open a capture unit connected to timer three is the source. So we're going to, Capture on every rising edge. Could be falling edge, of course. It's going to be on the internal one capture. Can't remember what that does. Timer three source, turn it on. Configure the interrupt for the capture to be on and at priority three, and then clear its flag. So that every time we get a capture, we're going to take a capture interrupt. In the capture interrupt, we can now record the exact time at which the edge went high. But the timing of the interrupt is not critical because, it, because the hardware captures the edge. Then at our leisure, 50 cycles later, we can read it. Let's go back and look at the interrupt. There's two interrupts. As I said, I turned on the timer two interrupt. All the timer two interrupt does is set bit zero on port B clear the flag, and clear bit zero. So I get a very fast pulse on the order of a few dozen nanoseconds wide out of the interrupt, which I can use as a trigger or a time base or whatever I want for my oscilloscope, because I was trying to figure out how this all operated by debugging with the oscilloscope. So this was the tick time base for the, for the oscilloscope, and not much else. All of the interesting stuff happens in the input capture one interrupt where we read the capture, compute the capture period as the new capture minus the last capture, and as I said, that works across a recent, an overflow boundary. Then we, we update last capture to the new capture, but I also wanted to see what the highest and lowest value read was. And if everything is working correctly, the high and the low should be the same, and it should be the exact value that I want to read, and it was. So this just does, this just gets the maximum period read and the minimum period read. We clear the interrupt flag and, and, and drop out of here again. Again, 
doing this read is not time critical because the actual capture to the C1 register was done many cycles ago on the edge of the on the on the basis of the hardware event which was the input edge <clears throat> there's a command uh, uh, command thread here which does a couple of things it uh, allows you to set the generate period so you can change the the uh, the input and I got really crude I closed timer and then opened it again to change the generate period whereas I later on I found out I didn't have to do that you can just change the generate the, the period of the timer directly and there's a a command to print which fires off a print thread so the uh, this thread just waits until the printing go uh, value goes high uh, forms a output buffer spawns an output thread to to dump it to the uh, terminal signals uh, the print semaphore to say we're done and and stops itself turns itself self off again until the next time you ask ask for a printed value so for lab one you're going to use the input capture to get a very accurate time measurement of the of the uh, waveform Yes. Oh. Well, I can't remember the exact file in which it is. Uh, well, where are we here? Uh, you mean the the M one? the MIC1 read capture. Best thing to do is to open up the peripheral library, the XC32 peripheral library document, scroll down to the input capture and read the list of macros of which this is one. You can also on any Anytime you have this open in the in the uh, graphic user interface in the GUI, you can right click on that value and say show me. I think the actual command is you right click, you say navigate to definition, and it'll pop open the file where that is defined. Tamid, do you want to say something else? Oh, you don't even have to. So just control click takes you to the definition even an even shorter shortcut than I figured out. Okay, control click. We'll take you to the file. You can find out all of the macros that are defined for the C1 capture then. What else? <clears throat> by way of uh, emphasizing oh this is an old version okay your, your cache is needs to be reloaded the uh, by way of example I tried to overlap this display as much as I could 
could have actually gone down one more tenth of an inch and still got these wires in. But you want to overlap the display as much as possible onto the whiteboard. Need rigidity. <clears throat> you might want to move this in also to keep the to keep the uh, hanging out part minimized when you put this back in the in the storage box. Although taking the CPU off the board is easy. Just pop it off, put it in the box, pop it back on when you when you take it out of the box again. That's fairly easy. Cycling this connector that holds the board, that holds the de development board onto the whiteboard is fairly easy. Cycling this connector, be careful. Don't do it. You can put a screwdriver right under here and twist and just pop that off very gently. If you grab it up here and pull, it'll break in half. Let's see, what else do we need to talk about for lab one? Any other questions on lab one? TFT came up easily last night, right? The display came up easily, no problems with that. ProThreads came up as long as you use the zip file on the TFT page. So, at this point, if there are no questions, then the next lecture I'll start on Lab 2. A lot of stuff to cover. Lab 2 is going to be uh, a DTMF dialer. We have to find out how to scan a keypad and debounce it. Have to learn about direct digital synthesis, how to, how to, how to build a sine wave from scratch. And... How to run the SPI DAX, how to hook up an SPI channel to quickly run the, the DAX that are, uh, we're going to be using. So there's a fair amount of material to go over. It's nice to get started before the lab is actually running. So we got three minutes. Who wants to talk about final projects? Yes? So I got really excited about making a combination signal generator and oscilloscope. Yeah. And I thought if it worked really well, I could kickstart it and put it on board. Uh -huh. Well, that sort of kills that, doesn't it? <laughs> to me, and I wrote an uh, article for Circuit Seller, which we have yet to hear about, uh, that does that also. Uh, let's see, the, the audio out, the, it's a basically audio rate. It'll sample at about 900,000 samples a second for the oscilloscope, and it'll, and it'll uh, synthesize at, what, 200,000 samples a second? 250, something like that. So it's a pretty good audio rate signal generator. However, that's just one aspect of it. For instance, what kind of bandwidth could you get for a, a laboratory instrument? Could you build a laboratory instrument which is, gives you several megahertz output that uh, has a nice display that has has controls you'd actually want to use as opposed to the ones in the lab which are pretty obscure. Uh, so building laboratory instruments is certainly a reasonable final project and a signal generator would be a good one. Getting the distortion down, the rate up, controls good. It's hard. Let's get a, oh yes. So you could imagine having a system, I'm not sure I quite heard all that, but the basic signal generator is sine triangle square. If you did this as a table lookup, you could have any arbitrary waveform you want. Then you have to ask, how long a table can you put on this system? Could you put a table that was long enough to play a, a, a three minute song? And so if you stay in memory, if you stay in, flat, in RAM, you have about 32,000 bytes 
you could expect to do something like a couple of seconds of, of wave, which would be long enough for any reasonable signal generator. If you wanted to go longer than that, you'd have to uh, put external memory on the system, probably in the form of data flash, which would allow you to put as many megabytes of memory in as long a table as you wanted. Then you could have a table-driven signal generator that you would load perhaps from a MATLAB program. That'd be pretty cool. So you come up with some function in MATLAB and you, and you have a serial interface that barfs it across to the technical term, that pushes it across to the uh, flash memory, which it can then read out. And you'd have to worry about continuity at the ends and maybe tapering it or something of the sort, but that could be done in the MATLAB end. Okay, thanks.